We love that you are here. Today we are on uh, our last um, bit of this series called Greater Invitation, where we're taking a look at um, different evangelism styles and, and how does the gospel make sense in our culture today. We're never compromising the message of the gospel, but we're contemplating what are some maybe different ways that we might share this unchanging message in the world that's rapidly changing around us. Quick note, um, Next Sunday. Next Sunday is what you call a standalone Sunday, and so it's not a part of a series. We're going to actually start a new series the Sunday after that called Unsinkable. It's going to be a Church United thing. Other churches are doing it. It's going to be great. But next Sunday is one of those Sundays that just kind of stand alone. And uh, I just feel like the Lord impressed on my heart uh, to preach on a, a topic that many of us are going through or we know somebody going through it. And we're going to be taking a look at how the gospel encouraging, encourages us in our parenting. Okay, in our parenting. And so if you are a parent, if you know a parent, if you think there's a parent around you that could be encouraged in the gospel, I want to make sure that you come out and invite them as well. And so we're going to take a Sunday to look at that, and then we're going to begin our next series. Okay, cool. Hey, so greater invitation. Did you know? A couple of did you knows. Um, did you know the Bible was written over about a, you know, now some of these, some of these are approximate, but approximately 1600 year uh, period that the scriptures that you have right here, uh, everybody hold up your Bible, even if you're holding your phone, just go ahead and do that. Yeah, awesome, cool. The, the Bible that you hold right there, it's, it's written over about a 1600 year uh, time period, three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, it was written by people from radically diverse occupations. Everyone from like uh, a doctor to a, a fisherman and all, all in between. It was written on three different continents. Okay, and so it was like completely uh, throughout the world. And, and as it pertains to prophecies, um, again, there's, there's, this is approximate, but it seems as though there's, a, there's approximately, especially um, like in line with Jesus, there's about a 300 direct prophecies that his life fulfilled from, from like his birth to where he would live, to how he would live, to how he would die. Things that you can't plan out. Like you, you can't plan out your birth, even if you knew where you were supposed to be born. Um, and it was just, there's just amazing things about the Bible that are true and rich and encouraging. They're actually enticing. And so um, I just wanted to start off there with just like a little slip. That's just like a, it's not even an appetizer. It's like you're smelling the appetizers that are about to come out um, of something really great called apologetics. Apologetics. Now apologetics um, is, is, if we could get like a, a, a definition for it. Apologetics, this is my definition, okay? So you know it's about at the seventh grade level, so work with me, okay? If you were expecting the, the, the master's degree level, talk to Pastor John Hicks or somebody else, but I'm going to give you the seventh grade level. Here it is. Inviting others to Jesus through a journey of fact, reason, and history. Um, The reason I brought that up about the Bible is I think it's pretty cool that you have this book that was written in three different continents by like uh, like, like 40 authors, and and they they come from different uh, backgrounds, stuff like that. Um, And it's all about one person. It all has the same like storyline. It's all about how God is going to come and rescue the world through this person named Jesus and how he's then going to come back and renew all things. Like every portion of the Bible that was written on the three different continents and by all these different authors and in, in the different languages in different time periods, they all point to the same person named Jesus and they all tell the same story with no contradiction. They all talk about a humanity that's broken and in trouble and in need of a savior greater than themselves. They name him as Jesus. They say where he's going to be born. They say how he's going to live. They say how he's going to die. They talk about this crazy thing like he's going to come back from the dead. And then Jesus fulfills all that. And the story doesn't end there. The story ends by saying Jesus is coming back to renew all things. It's hard enough if we got like just this middle row of our church here together, it would be hard enough for you after this message is over to each give um, a, a synopsis of the message that said the same thing. You guys would be all over the place, right? You'd be like, oh, he was, he was talking about uh, songs and Waymaker. And, no, no, he was talking about the Bible and how the Bible's really important. And no, he was talking about apologies. I don't know what he's sorry for, but he said apologetics. I don't get... <laughs> and so, you know, like, and that's just in this little message right here. And so what I wanted to do is I just wanted to like entice you a little bit so that you would understand that we have a highly intelligent and defendable faith. You do not have to check your intelligence at the door to be deeply in love with Jesus. 
You don't have to do that. And as a matter of fact, if you do it, it will probably hinder how much you love Jesus. Because what you know about him or about a person actually accentuates how you love that person. And so um, another more scholarly um, definition, if you will, of apolo apologetics goes like this. Uh, it's, it's by um, Joshua Chetra and Mark Allen. Um, they wrote this book um, called Apologetics at the Cross, an introduction for Cr Christian witness. And this is what they say about kind of the purpose of apologetics. Um, it clears the debris of doubt out of people's paths and propels them forward toward the gospel. Apologetics, the defense of the faith. Apologetics is the defense of the faith. And the reason for apologetics is not that we win arguments and sound super smart. The reason for apologetics is that it clears out some of the debris that might be keeping people from the cross of Christ and it propels them to Jesus. That's a great definition for apologetics. That's a great framework for thinking about why would I want to defend my faith? Why would I want to invest myself in things that broaden my knowledge so that I have a more defendable faith? Well, it, 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 it like um, encourages my own heart, but it also helps people around me who have stuff in the way of the cross. It helps to clear some of that out so they can see Jesus more beautifully. And, and so that's where we're going to be headed today. And I'm just going to ask the Spirit to be our teacher and we're going to hop in. Father, I pray that you would send your Spirit as you already have. I just welcome you, Holy Spirit. We worship you and we ask that you would be our teacher, our motivator, our guide, and that you would win our hearts to Christ today. Amen and amen. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts um, chapter 17 and then 1 Peter 3. We'll be uh, between those two. Uh, passages. But the one thing I want to tell you today, it's the title of a John Piper book that I've never read, but I like the title. Does that lose credibility for you? Some of you thought this was going to be an intellectual message and I just blew it there. <laughs> it's me, but I love this title. Ready? Here's the title. Think. Think. I think sometimes, myself included, we don't do enough thinking as Christians. As people who follow Christ, have we really thought through what we believe and why we believe it. It's not only encouraging to our own hearts, but listen, we're talking about greater invitation. And we're trying to position ourselves in such a way where we would be better, we would have like a greater ability to invite those who don't know Jesus to Jesus. One of the best ways we can do that is to actually think about our faith. Think through it. Read other people who have thoughts about our faith. I mean, I, I think it's like, um, I, I'm not saying it's a command. I just feel like this is what God wants us to, he's encouraging us today and even this week and maybe in the season of our life to do a bit more thinking about what we say we believe and even why we believe it. So there's two guys that I've, that I've brought in that are going to help us with it. One's the Apostle Paul and the other's the Apostle Peter. Okay, and so I brought them in. We're going we're gonna to walk through kind of how they did that, and then we're going to make some application uh, to how we might do that. So Paul, in chapter 17 of Acts, he does it for us. And so watch this. We're going to see a bit of a model for his apologetics, okay, for his defense of the faith. So he's in Acts 17. We were um, in Acts 17 last week, and we're taking a look at how Paul um, brings the gospel in a relevant way culturally. Okay, we saw how he entered this place and how he, he helped the gospel and culture make sense. They actually, are, they're, they're not enemies. The, the gospel actually brings the fullness to the culture that, that, that's around us. Culture's, culture's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just longing for something greater and richer than what it actually has without Christ. And when you understand culture in light of the gospel, you're able to see the fullness of God in some of the things that we enjoy. Music, movies, art, whatever the case may be. We looked at that last week. This week, we're going to take a look at what is, what's kind of Paul's way. How does he do it? How does, how does he do it in an, an apologetic way? How does he defend the faith, if you will? And, and so check this out. As, as Paul went in, and, and this, is, this is him at the beginning of, of Acts 17, and he's being persecuted, so he's in another city. As Paul went in, as was his custom... And on three Sabbath days, he, say that word with me, reasoned, reasoned stay on this slide here, please, with them from the scriptures. Okay, so two things to note here on this, on this first passage, and there's a little bit more here. Um, uh, would you go back just a second, Dave, please? Go back to that, that other scripture there, please, buddy. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, so 
we, we have two things here. We see that it was his custom, which means it was something that he did normally. This was a normal pattern for him. And, and what was the normal pattern for him? Well, he found, he found the, he went in on the Sabbath, he would find a temple, he would find a place where people were at least talking about religious things. And then he went in and he reasoned with them. He didn't yell at them. He didn't manipulate them. He didn't force them. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. From the scriptures. So it's a good thing for you to know that your scriptures are reliable for this. Sometimes when we think about apologetics, we think, man, well, we need to leave the scriptures and go get a bunch of other data out here. That's not, the other data is not bad, but look at how Paul does apologetics. He, he, he reasons, he thinks through how the scriptures that this particular um, community of Jewish people honor, he thinks through how those scriptures point to a Messiah. And, and he stays with them for a couple of days. Okay, next slide, please. Explaining and proving. Explaining and proving. And so he takes time to explain and unpack things in an intellectual way that it was necessary for what? For the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ is the Christ. Okay, and so from this particular passage of Scripture, we're able to see that, that Paul did a couple of things. He, as it was his custom, he went in and, and he was with people who would at least give him a hearing. He didn't force himself upon somebody. He didn't um, break down the door and, and demand to be heard. He came in to a somewhat of a, uh, even though they may not have been warm at the end, there was, they were kind of like a warm lead at the beginning, okay? So there was like a natural relationship that he had with these people just because he himself was Jewish. And then this is what he does. He reasons with them. He explains things to them. Now it said there, I think he said that he was there three days, if I'm not mistaken, in this particular passage, okay? And so it, this isn't like a one and done for Paul. This is like an on, he commits himself to the ongoing conversation of helping people to understand something greater than their current reality. He reasons, he explains, he does these things, and he doesn't do it just once, it was his custom. And so it brings us to this idea of, of the importance of reason, if you will. The importance of reason. Now, um, not, not, to, not to divide the crowd between uh, reason and, um, like, let's say, early adopters, but uh, just a quick survey. If we, were to, if we were to divide you into early adopters where you're like ready to buy into a, an idea because it feels right, even though you don't have a lot of logic and reason behind it yet, uh, raise your hand. Any early adopters in here? Uh, my hand's up. You're like, okay, I can go with that. I don't, I don't know how it's going to fully work out, but I'll go and we'll plant this crazy church in Delray with you. There should be nine of you at least that have your hand up that said yes to that, okay? All right, cool. How many of you are like, not a bad idea, don't hate it, don't love it, Need some more fact, need some more reason. Let me see your hands. All right, cool. All right, I got a hot crowd today. Awesome, great. So, so Paul respects that. We should respect that. That's in the church, people. Like you guys are actually here. So imagine outside of here how important reason is. So as, as we look at Paul, and we look at our first example of apologetics sort of gone good, we want to see that there's a, there's, there's a great importance for reason and I believe it's because it's, it's, like, um, it's like a love language. It's like a love language. I was working through this and thinking through that. And I, I mean, maybe, maybe that's dawned on me before, but I'm not really sure that I've ever thought of apologetics as a love language. For me, sometimes I think of love language as like, um, like feeling and, and passion and things like that. And I think of apologetics as like intellect and high academia, academia and, and all that. And I, and I almost separate the two. And I think that's an unfair separation. That's not good. That's not good because just even in the body of Christ, reason is hugely important. How much so is it important outside of the body of Christ to people who don't know who Jesus is? And so for us, I think we need to shift, or maybe it's just me and I'm catching up to you, but we need to shift in our understanding of apologetics and the importance of reason and understand it as actual love language. It's a love language. So if you were to come and if you were to have seen my marriage um, for the first couple of years, it, it would not have looked like it does now. Our marriage did not begin to flourish until we started to learn to speak each other's love language. I knew my love language really well, okay? And so I don't, like, so we've been married uh, 20, 
three. Right, baby? Here's. She doesn't know. She's not sure. 20 plus. Okay, we're going to go 20 plus. And if you were to be there the first three, you might have seen a scene like this. Me coming home and just like really speaking my love language and expecting it to be spoken back. Like, babe, you look good tonight. <laughs> wow. That shirt on you, oh my goodness, it's doing something to my heart. Oh man, I just love being married to you, baby. And I love being with you and we're gonna go on this date. And I'm, man, I, it's just, I've been thinking about you and, and just, I just can't express enough how much you mean to me and, and how you are like, there's Jesus, but then you're my second girl and, and I love you so much. Expecting that she would, of course, reciprocate and at least notice, oh, babe, you got a new shirt. Oh, man, it's so glad. I'm glad to be going out with you. And, oh, oh, like, wow, you're, man, I know we're in year like one of our marriage, but you're just crushing it as a husband. And you, I've just been dreaming about you all day. And I've, I'm not just like, uh, like, I'm, 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 I love you. I've been thinking about you even, all, like, even sexually, I've been thinking about you. Like, I just, I wanted to hear these things. <laughs> so, um, let, me, let me tell you her love language, okay? So that would be my love language. And, that, and so I'm like speaking it, waiting to hear it back, you know? And her love language might be like, hey, babe, what's up? So good to see you. Um, so the kitchen is super organized and, and um, we're really clean right here. And this, this, this place is so, it's, uh, it's so harmonious to come in here, right? Because everything's clean and in order. And, um, and, you know, like I've worked really hard and I, I know you didn't see me last night stay up late and take care of the kitchen or this morning, get up. but, but like um, I've, I've done all this service for our family to flourish. Okay, and so here, here's what she was expecting me to think that was awesome. And I'm like, babe, let's just do the dirty house. Please tell me you really, really love me and like think I'm awesome. And she's like, hey, how about pick up a vacuum every now and then, bro? Like I know that you think I'm super pretty, but like, can you, can, can we do this together? And so it was almost like we weren't necessarily wrong. We just were speaking our own personal love languages probably really loud and expecting them to be spoken back to us. And then when they weren't spoken back to us, it was kind of like frustrating because here I was, I was like, man, like I'm, you know, does she love me? Does she not? And here she is. She's like, does he love me? Does, does he not? And, and it, it's because we hadn't, we didn't even know. And then once we knew, we, I think it took us, maybe it took me a little bit longer than her, even a while to decide to speak that love language. Because really, I, I, even though I knew that was her love language, I just really wanted her, I just really wanted to speak my love language to her. That's what I knew better. And so as we think about apologetics, I think sometimes some of us are like, man, I'm not going to go there. Like, I don't know the defense of creation. I don't know why God allows suffering. I don't know this, that, and that. And, and yet we have people around us who are waiting for us to actually do a little research and get some like rich and fulfilling answers to bring back to them. But we just keep speaking our love language like, I'm going to pray for you. Come to church. Here's the latest Bible verse I read. And they have no... That's like me saying, baby, you look good and leaving the health filthy. It's not, not loving. I feel good about it, but it's not actually loving to the person that God's called me to love. And so I think a framework that, that we get from Paul here is that reason is important because it's actually incredibly loving to the outside world who's waiting for us to maybe give a little bit more reason for the hope that we hang on to so hard. Well, what else? I invited Peter here with us too. And Peter, he writes a letter. It's uh, in 1 Peter uh, 3. And, and we pick it up in, in 3, uh, beginning in verse 13 through 17 is the actual passage I would encourage you guys to read. I'm going to pick it up here in one, one portion of it that I think really speaks to um, the importance of something else. And Peter um, tells us, he, he's like, listen, man, people are going to persecute you. That's a part of it. But they can't but they can't really do anything to you, okay? So, so they might get you, they might, they might come after you. In his case, it might have been more physical. In our case, we might lose our jobs. We might, we might lose a friendship. We might, like, when you begin to take a stand for Christ, even if you do it in the most loving way, it, it can oftentimes cost you things that your former life afforded you. And so Peter's like, man, but, but really, they can't really get at us because our treasures protect, like, like, what are they gonna do? 
Like, like you're eternally secure in Christ. And so and he talks about um, this is how we should move forward with people who might be against us and even a greater application just overall. This is something for us to be equipped with as we live the Christian life. And in 1 Peter 3, um, 15, it says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. So a couple of things there that I think are, are radically important to us. The first one is the greatest preparation you can have for apologetics is not more time on a Ravi Zacharias website. Now listen, at the end of this message, he's going to be one of my main resources, okay? So Ravi Zacharias is awesome. You should Google him and Google the word apologetics after him and you're going to get great stuff. Another resource that I'm going to give you, and I'm just going to give it to you now because sometimes I forget to give you good stuff at the end, is Gospel Coalition. Put in Gospel Coalition Apologetics. You'll get really awesome stuff. Those are, those are good things that will help you to be prepared for an answer. But they're not the most helpful. They're secondary things. The most helpful thing you can do to prepare your heart in order to give an answer that defends the faith that you have is to honor Jesus Christ as holy, as set apart as your extreme treasure and Lord. To learn what it means to live life like this. Jesus, you are my love. You are who I am most in love with. I worship you. I honor you. Jesus, you're my king of kings. You're my treasure. You're my friend. You're my life. And now I want to go learn a little bit more from Ravi Zacharias. And now I want to go learn a little bit more about creation. And now I want to go learn a little bit more about, like, the science and, and this issue and that issue. And I want, to be a little, I want to be a little better equipped in these areas that matter to me, but they also matter to my friends even more than me. Only after, as Peter calls us to, we've, we've put Christ as holy. We've honored him as holy. That means set apart. That means there's no close second. That means as much as I adore my wife, it looks like I don't even like her compared to how much I love Jesus. That's the, that's the difference that Jesus is calling us to. And in actuality, the more I do that, the more I love her. And the more beautifully I'm able to serve her. But I put a separation between Jesus and every other love in my life. This is the greatest way we prepare our hearts to make a defense for the hope that we have because you talk most easily and usually most fluently about what you love the most. Ask me about my kids. I can't wait. I'm at a wedding last night. I'm like, dude, I, I'm, I'm ready to pull out my phone and show a picture of my kids. It's my family. This is my kids. This is my daughter. My senior daughter. She's going away next year, I heard. I think we're going to let her go to college, maybe. I don't know. Let me, tell you about, let me tell you about her heart. Let me tell you about how she worships Jesus with me on Sunday and puts her arm around me and prays for me in the back. Let me tell you about how she loves her volleyball. Let me tell you about how loyal she is to her family. Let me tell you about what she says when you guys give me feedback about something. She's like a fierce lion. She's like, well, they can just leave. I'm like, whoa, settle down, baby. <laughs> It's okay, baby. Feedback's good. Daddy doesn't always get it right. It's really easy for me to talk about Caroline. It's really easy for me to talk about Cole. It's really easy for me to talk about Cade. It's really easy for me to talk about Cora. These are things that just flow for me because I am deeply in love with them. So if you want to be able to make a defense to improve your apologetics, for, to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the reason, for the reason, for the reason, for the hope that is in you, what would benefit you most is to fall deeper in love with that hope because that will increase the way you talk about him. How do we do it? We do it with gentleness and respect. We do it with gentleness 
and respect. This brings us to the importance of relationship. Importance of relationship. And here I, I think that apologetics, it's really a heart issue. I mean, sometimes we want to make it a head issue, but, but really at the core of it, it's a heart issue. And it's, and it's about a relationship vertically that you pursue between yourself and Christ. And then it's about a relationship that you pursue horizontally as we do it with gentleness and respect. Um, I think we, we, and this is, this is on your outline here, there's, there's a few kind of practical outworkings of this that I want to... Uh, encourage us in before we go to the communion table. One thing I'd like you to do is just think about your own story. Think about your own story. Um, if you are a believer in Christ, if you are a person who has received the invitation to surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you've believed the gospel message that God needs to, that God really, in his holiness, he needs to punish you and separate you because your heart's wicked and evil, just like mine, just like my daughters, just like all the people I love. Our hearts are wicked and evil. Like that's, that's, the, that's the bent of our heart. But, but God is not wicked and evil. God's radically loving. And he, and he could, and, he, and in, some, in some cases, we, you could make a case that he should separate himself forever from us. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. He pursues us in the midst of our wickedness and he, he sent his son and his son goes to a cross and on the, on the cross, your sin, my sin, our wickedness, our evil, it's put on Christ and, and he receives the penalty that would have separated us from the Father. Radical, sometimes even irrational love. I know we're talking a lot about reason today, but there are parts of the gospel that you, that you can't always put behind what you might say reason unless you're going to put it behind a, king, a godly reason. He crushes his son in our place. Jesus dies the death that you and I should have died and on the third day he's brought back from the dead. He overcomes our sin, he overcomes our death and, and the way that we receive the effects of that, the way that we're now made into right relationship with God is we simply believe it. We quit living for ourselves, it's, it's called repentance. We turn from that perspective on life and we, we say, Jesus, you're it. What you've done and who you are, you're it and I receive you as Savior, Lord, and treasure. When, when you come to faith in Christ that way, you're forgiven, you're brought into the family, your sins are wiped out as far as the east is from the west and I wonder in your story if that's true of you, how many of you did apologetics play a part in it? There was probably a couple of you. There's probably, probably, probably some of you who were like, man, I was pretty hard against the gospel until somebody walked alongside me and showed me the reasoning behind the gospel. And I think that's super cool. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the apologetics that brought you to the cross, even though they may have been primary in you coming to the cross, the cross and Jesus himself has now become primary in your life. Somebody likened it to um, like uh, a blind date. And they said apologetics is a little bit like a blind date. So if any of you are on like the dating websites, okay, you're, maybe you're on Christian Mingle, maybe you're on um, eHarmony. I'll just leave it there before I go into the others, okay? Like, just leave it right there. Wherever you might be. They were saying like apologetics is kind of like going on a blind date, right? And so on a blind date, you can't know everything about that person, but you just need to know enough until you, that, that, that propels you to get you to meet that person and then the magic takes over. Apologetics is the same way. We're just helping remove obstacles enough so that it propels people to the person of Jesus and then the magic takes over. Like, let's just get people to meet the person of Jesus and watch him do the rest. The importance of relationship is huge. And so this is, this is kind of how we finish up here, guys. It's at the bottom of your outline. And I think these are really important for us as we get ready to move forward with this idea of like apologetics being really important to us um, in our evangelism. The first one, these are commitments, if you will. Let's just call them greater invitation um, commitments. And there's a few here. There's some blanks that you'll see. Um, and these are commitments that I'm going to ask you to make if you're going to go out from the Avenue Church and you're, you're going you're to like kind of um, 
sort of represent this culture, these, I think, are not only from Scripture, but these are like really important to us as a culture here at the Avenue Church. Okay, so um, if, if and, I, and I encourage you to increase your apologetic knowledge, but only do it if you're going to make these commitments. Here they are. Here's the first one. We're going to make a commitment to, go ahead, throw that up, to wooing versus winning. Let's make a commitment to wooing people versus winning arguments, okay? Is that cool? Yeah. Like, like, I have a guy. If somebody comes and asks me about creation, I got, I got a guy. Like, I'm going to be able to talk to you a little bit, but I'm going to send you to Rob Sweeten. And Rob Sweeten is going to walk you through creation. He's going to walk you through Noah. He's going to walk you through the earth chain. All this stuff that I don't, I'm like, man, I just, I know this, but I know Rob. And so, and here's one of the things I trust about Rob. Rob is not in it to knock somebody out with an argument so that he can then walk over them and see, see, <laughs> sucker. <laughs> now what? And like, they're like, oh man, I can't believe I used to believe what I, and they're just like left staggering. Because Rob Sweeten is committed to wooing that person to Jesus, not just winning an argument. Second commitment, conversation versus mic dropping. Sort of in the same line. But some of you have like awesome, you, you have like awesome one-liners from Ravi Zacharias or from these people that, that you know and that you, you respect, right? Maybe you have this amazing, um, you have this amazing Tim Keller quote, like it's in your pocket, right? And you're ready to bring it out when somebody asks you about how can evil exist in the world today. And so somebody comes to you and, and, they, and you know, they're all broken and, and you're like, oh, I know what. And you drop your Tim Keller quote about how a loving good God could allow school shootings or could allow um, what's going on in Haiti or could allow the Bahamas situation. How can that happen? And you've got, your, you've got your apologetic. You've got your thing. And you drop it. And you're like, this is why. Because blah, blah, blah. And you're like, now what? And you're, you like can't be found after that. They want to they converse with you. They've got a rebuttal. But you don't have a second Tim Keller quote. So you're out. So you're like hiding over here and you're trying to call one of the. No, no, no. Will you commit to the ongoing conversation of these issues that are deeply important to the lost world around us as opposed to simply a sound bite or a tweet or a mic drop that makes you feel better and that person is still lost and going to hell. Will you commit to the ongoing conversation where they might have a really good rebuttal to you and, and you're left with having to find more information? Will you commit to the humility of actually valuing a lot of what they think and have to say even though you might not agree with it? Will you commit to that ongoing conversation like Paul did where he reasoned with them, as was his custom. Third one, will you commit to knowing one thing versus everything? One thing versus everything. I'm going to call the team up here. We're going to get in place and get ready for our communion moment, guys. So come on up, worship team. Will you commit to knowing one thing versus everything? So there is a ton to learn about apologetics. You can get lost in this world of being able to defend all these different ideas and topics, and it's super interesting and awesome. And I encourage you to get as much information and knowledge as you possibly can about a ton of topics. But I would encourage you to do that after you get proficient at one topic. Here's the topic you need to be proficient in. It's the same topic that Paul and Peter and the New Testament authors, they were all proficient in this one topic. You ready? It's the topic of the resurrection. Get proficient at proving the resurrection. Every Easter, we take a look at some of the facts and the, and the things that like really are like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, wow, that's a great point. That's good. But, but here's what, go to those websites that I told you, Ravi Zacharias, Gospel Coalition, Google um, apologetics concerning the resurrection. Get really good at defending the resurrection because most of the New Testament preaching centers on whether or not Jesus actually got up. Because if he got up, if Jesus destroyed death, then that means everything else is true. If Jesus was like, okay, I'm going to be dead for a minute, but now I'm bigger, stronger, and badder than death, and you can trust me, then that just quiets everything else. So get really good at defending the history, 
the actual real resurrection of Jesus. I'm not talking about Jesus rising in your heart. I'm talking about there was a dead man who is alive today. Resurrection. Learn how to defend that. Next, worship versus willpower. This is where we're gonna, this is where we're gonna wrap it up. Worship versus willpower. I don't know of any of you who, who are here today who love Jesus and are followers of Jesus because somebody forced you, because somebody beat you into it. We don't talk people into the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit woos people. The Holy Spirit is the evangelist. So if you want to use your willpower, then simply use your willpower to get better at worshiping Jesus. Spend time in prayer for people. Fast. Seek the face of the Father. Come to gatherings like this and participate in community worship. Get in small groups. Get in small groups. Get in small groups where the gospel comes alive in a way that it cannot come alive to you when you're alone reading your Bible. Worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. I invite you even now as we prepare our hearts to take communion. I'm inviting you to worship Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm setting you apart as holy and I realize this is how I prepare to defend my faith by putting you in the number one spot by reminding myself and you and the world around me that you are my treasure. I'm going to invite you guys now as we prepare for worship, there's going to be a table here. We've got two tables in the back. Before we move toward worship, I mean, before we move toward the table where there's going to be bread and, and juice to, to take that reminds us of his body and his blood, that you would just take a second and worship Jesus in your heart. There may be some of you who have never worshiped Jesus. I'm inviting you, listen, I'm inviting you to respond to the gospel that I just preached. I'm inviting you to say, I'm a sinner and I need you, Jesus, and today's my first day of worshiping you as my savior and as my treasure. Worship Jesus first, whether you know him or today's your first day of knowing him. And then let's participate in doing what Jesus told us to do, which is taking the bread and taking the cup and being reminded of what he's done for us. And so here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow for a moment of, of worship here now and, and, and then I'm gonna say, okay, we, we can go. And when I dismiss us to the tables, um, we invite people who know Jesus. We invite people who understand that he's their Savior and Lord. And um, we invite you, if, if you find yourself in a place where you're, you don't know Jesus or you're making peace with sin in, in some area of your heart, the best thing for you to do is, n is probably not go today or either decide before you go that no longer am I going to make peace in that area. The scriptures say, examine your hearts. And when you understand yourself to need Jesus and be pursuing Jesus, then the table is there to nourish you. But if you understand yourself to not know Jesus or, or to have an area of your heart that's like hardened to Jesus, the table actually, well, I think it's an opportunity for us to be convicted and to change. And so for all of us who are really needy and really hopeful that Jesus is enough, the tables are for us. And so let's just take a moment of worship. We'll just have some music play behind us. We're not going to start any song just yet. And just in your own way, in your own heart, worship Jesus for the first time or for the 500th time. Amen and amen. When you're ready, you can come to either this table or one of those in the back and uh, bring the elements back to your, back to your seats and we'll all participate uh, together. Come on forward.
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, and I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. when Jesus was betrayed he took the bread and he broke it and he said do this in remembrance of me take eat and as we're reminded of how his body was broken for the forgiveness of our sins he also took the cup and he poured it out and he said this is to be a remembrance that my blood will be poured out so that yours won't have to be 
so that you can actually be forgiven. And Paul takes it one step further and says it's not only a remembering, it's not only a memory, but it's also a looking forward to what Jesus promises to fulfill. Take, drink. I'm going to ask you to stand as we are dismissed with a benediction. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come on up front. And prayer partners, if you would, just come on up now and identify yourself. This is going to be our, our benediction and our dismissal. But if you, if you want prayer, if you want somebody to pray over you, your family, something maybe the Lord's been doing in this particular moment, we would love to offer that for you. So our prayer partners will be here as long as you need. At this point, if you're comfortable, you might want to turn your hands like this because you're going to be receiving a benediction. A benediction is like a promise for God's people. And so I'm going to, I'm going to give you that promise. Now may... The God that we have the joy to explain, defend, talk about with great love in our hearts. May the God who has destroyed death and brought about life in times of refreshment, may he bless you, may he keep you, and may he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace as you honor him in your hearts as holy and invite others to do the same. Amen and amen. Love you guys.